<laughs> Amen. Merry Christmas. Worship team, thank you all for a phenomenal job. Amen. Let's come on, show the worship team some love and appreciation. Uh, we just thank God for them. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for being a part of what God is doing here in our midst. And we're going to go right to the word. Um, before we do that, I almost forgot. New Year's Eve, um, this is the place to be, uh, not the nightclubs or any club or any hotel. Um, you want to be here New Year's Eve because um, <laughs> the, the, let me see how many, how many old people we have here. We're going to be going like this. Oh, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, good. We good. We good. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> we good. <laughs> We're good. So New Year's Eve, all right? This is the place to be. Um, we're going to have Carolyn Trailer. She's going to be with us, who's a professional singer, stellar award nominee. Um, for the younger people, um, Josiah is going to be with us. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be... <laughs> That's going to be awesome. Stand up so they can see you, Josiah. Amen. Yeah, come on. Let them, let's get you yeah, That's Josiah. Yeah. Our own recording artist, Baby Jew. So we're looking forward to that. And then Davey K is going to be with us. We've got some talented people, and that's going to be performing on that night. And then our own worship team. So we're excited about what God's going to do. You don't want to miss that. We have some guest churches that's going to be here as well, too, as we bring in the new year with great style. Amen. Grab your Bibles, uh, go with me to a very, 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 very familiar passage of Scripture. Um, I will not be before you long at all uh, on this New Year's Eve. I'm sorry, Christmas Eve. Gosh, what's with me and New Year's? I'm excited about the concert, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited about the concert. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 16. And then not only that, this morning, all my sermon slides, like, had the wrong Scripture on it. And all these elders in here, nobody helped me out. Took a worship team person to say, hey, pastor, you have the wrong scripture on all your slides. And so we had to work hard in between services and fix it. So all is well. Amen. John chapter 3, John chapter 3, um, verse 16. Very, very familiar passage of scripture. Uh, we've been in this series on radical discipleship for quite some time. But um, during the Advent season, we've been setting up what we're going to be talking about today. So if you're in John 16, let me hear you say amen. amen. Okay. Here's what I want to do. I want to read this out loud together. So invite us all to read together. Then we'll pray. And then we'll talk through just uh, four simple things that I want to share with you so we can allow God to be God. And let's read on the count of three. One, two, three, together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son... That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting. Let's do it one more time together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, meet Jesus, God's greatest gift to you. Tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, meet Jesus. God's greatest gift to you. Amen. Amen. Come on, bow your heads with me. Let's pray now. We're going to go into the Word. Father, we thank you for you. We open our hearts, Lord, that you would move in our midst, that you would get praise, you would get the glory out of what would be said. We love you this morning. We worship you and we adore you. So we pray that as your Word goes forth, that should there be one here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, God, that you would just bring them to a relationship with you. We thank you for your Word. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for this Christmas Eve, Lord, that we can come together to celebrate you and to just worship you in just a great way and to listen to the little ones sing and to just give you praise. So we open our hearts, uh, speak through me to your people. Felix dies and moves out of the way because I have nothing to say, Lord, and we just want to encourage our body this morning as we give you praise, honor, and glory. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to keep your Bibles open as we talk through um, that passage of scripture that's in front of us. But um, most of you know Christmas is a time of giving. It's a time where we um, express our love, our appreciation, our, our joys, our um, relationship that we have with people we love, people we care about, people that we just, that are dear and precious to our heart. It's a time, Christmas, it's a time where we end up exchanging gifts. And, and uh, Pastor Tani and I were talking about this this week. One of the interesting things about Christmas is people that don't have resources all of a sudden find a way to get it, right? <laughs> Come on, y'all, amen. 
we, we find a way to get it. And, and it's all because the season is so precious to us. The season means so much. It's a time of gift giving. It's a time when we say we love. It's a time when we say we care. Here's one of the interesting things about Christmas. Christmas is even that time of year where family members that might not ordinarily get along take time to stop arguing or stop their disagreements just long enough to express love and concerns for each other. It's time where there might have potentially been dissensions or disagreements in household. We just pause long enough to tell Jesus happy birthday and to let each other know that we appreciate and we love them. Now, the thing that I want to share with you this morning, even though Christmas is a time of gift giving, I don't want us to miss the true meaning and the true essence of what this season is all about. Even though it's a time we, when we exchange gifts with each other, I need us not miss that this really is the season when God gave us the greatest gift ever. Come on, can I get an amen or two? Come on. It's the time when he gave us the greatest gift ever. And so we want to take a moment just to look for, just for a few moments, just briefly, at this text that's in front of us in John, the third chapter, to talk about Jesus, God's greatest gift to man. Now, here's what you need to know about this text. Nicodemus, who is the protagonist for the story that we are, or the main character for the story that's in front of us, he, he really approaches Jesus, and these are my words, with the framework where he wants to know, what do I need to do to be a radical disciple for Christ? Since we've been talking about radical discipleship, that's his approach. He, he goes secretly to Jesus to ask him, how can I be a radical disciple or what needs to happen within me so I can be who you would have me to be? Now, what you need to know about Nicodemus' approach to Jesus is that it's really premised in the two part series that we've been talking about leading up to today's passage. If you were here for the past two weeks and you were to retract with me to the book of John chapter 1, when the story begins, we saw John the baptizer doing his coming out, if you will, or I wish we had time to go through all of this, but we really don't. Um, I mean, in encourage you to go online and watch. John is coming out from tradition, and then my words, he, he makes this public announcement of his call, and he violates all cultural norm. He violates everything that was standard at that day and age to just go out across by the Jordan, across this, this place, and he's baptizing people into a relationship with God. Now, the thing that John is doing, he's baptizing both Jews and he's baptizing both Gentiles alike for the remission of sins, setting them aside. And here's what he's saying. All John is doing is he's pointing people to Jesus as a forerunner, saying that all I'm doing is I'm setting precedence for the one who's coming after me. Now, here's the reason I gave you that piece of information is because when John stepped out, the Bible says in John chapter 1 that the Jews sent people to inquire of John, why are you doing what you're doing? Because understand with me, this is the first time they had a lay prophet, if I may use the term, that violates their, their paradigms, that violates their systems, that didn't go through their training process, and he steps out now when he's preaching. So they sent a delegation to ask him, by what authority are you doing this? Are you a prophet? Are you Elijah? Are you, I mean, they're asking him all these questions. And here's John's statement. I am simply a voice. Come on, y'all. We need more voices. I'm simply a voice of one crying out in the wilderness saying, prepare the way. But he sent this delegation back with the message to the Jewish council to say to them that's who he was. Then next, last week, we looked at the fact that Jesus the next day comes on the scene. And then here's what John says to his audience. He says now, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so in essence, here's the big idea we share with you. John now is saying to his audience, meet Jesus, God's remedy for sin. Now, church, I don't know about you, but, but I'm still blessed by that thought and that concept to know that when you meet Jesus, I wish I had somebody in here. It, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't 
matter the shortcoming. It doesn't matter the failing. Jesus really is God's remedy for sin. Oh, come on, y'all. That's, that's good news. That's really good news. And the reason I find comfort in that is that it doesn't matter what I did yesterday or, who, or my failings or my shortcoming. Jesus paid it all. And God loved me so much that he sent a solution to the problems of the sins of the world. So now, John introduces Jesus as God's remedy for sin. And to make sure, we, a long story short, or to abstract up a little bit, Jesus goes about his earthly ministry. And what you need to know about Jesus' earthly ministry at the very onset of his ministry is the same delegation that sent representatives to look at John to see what John was doing were no doubt holding business meetings back in their private chambers saying, who is this fella? Who is this guy that's now all of a sudden out here doing what he's doing? Now, for those of you that know your Bible, assuming for a moment Nicodemus was still, I mean, not Nicodemus, Zacharias was, um, John's father was still alive, he's probably a part of the meeting. Man, we, we know what your son is doing, but then your nephew, man, what's he doing? Who, who authorized him? Who, who empowered this guy to do what he's doing? And then what's striking is we observe him and we watch him and we notice that he's got a little bit of power behind what he's doing. Come on now, I mean, he's turning water into wine and he's doing all this miraculous stuff. So there must be something unique, unique about him. Now, what I like about the, the, the context that's set around that, chapter 3 now opens up. And if you were to go to the beginning of uh, John chapter 3, here's what you're going to see. This protagonist or this fellow by the name of Nicodemus now, he comes privately to Jesus, and he doesn't come with a delegation. He doesn't come with representatives. He doesn't come with other members of the Sanhedrin. He comes by himself to inquire of Jesus who he really is. Now, I know this is free, y'all. I need somebody to hear me say that if you're going to find out who Jesus is, you really can't learn about him in the crowd. Oh, I wish I had some. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you got to go by yourself. Come on. You, you got to go because you risk being caught up in the emotion of, come on, y'all, of the crowd. And when the emotion is done, you would have nowhere else to go. But, 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 but it's in those still quiet moments, in those, it's in those intimate times, it's in that place where you are all alone and, and you have to worry by yourself and, and struggle by yourself to find out who he really is. And, and I'm led to believe that's where Nicodemus was because while the council were meeting and they were discussing, I, I am one of those guys that led to believe some believed and some doubted, and Nicodemus ended up being one of those guys who wanted to find out for himself. Listen to his approach. He goes to Jesus. Hey, G. <laughs> hey, Nick. What's up? And, and, and here, here, here's Nicodemus. We know that you are a teacher sent from God. Here's what Nicodemus is saying. We held meetings about you. Come on, y'all. And we've observed you. And we've at least come to the conclusion that you are anointed. That, that, that either we are missing something or, or you've got to be a unique person. Here's why. Because you're outdoing John. John was just baptizing with water for remission of sins. But we're seeing you doing all those miraculous things. And here's what he's saying. And the things that you're doing, we have concluded that the only way you're able to do that is God had to send you. Are you? Come on, talk to me this morning, church. So, 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 so Jesus being the Jesus that he is, he doesn't waste time with Nicodemus. He, he said, I know you're really trying to figure out how to be a radical disciple, dude. So here's what you got to do. Marvel not. I say to you, you what? Come on, y'all. Y'all know it. You must be what? born again. Now, now listen to Nick. Listen to Nick. Come on, G. Um, I'm old, man. I've been a member of this church for 40 years. How in the world do you expect me to go back in my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus, being the Jesus that he is, says to Nick, Nicodemus, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, right? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Marvel not, I say unto you, you must be 
born again. And then he goes into this whole thing about the wind blows and you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. And he sticks with his thesis, you must be born again. And then here's Nick, say, what, Jesus? What are you talking about? And then here's Jesus, come on, you are a teacher of the Jews and you don't know these things? Here's what he said, dudes, you've been in church all your life. What y'all teaching on Sunday morning? Come on, what, what y'all doing? I seen everybody waving handkerchief, talking about go on, preacher. What he been talking about? I right, like, come on, y'all talk to me. And 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 so Jesus, Jesus says, let me break this down, Nicodemus. And he goes about now with the text that's in front of us to paint a picture. Listen, Tom, I'm going to say this: that an Old Testament person making the transition to a. Well, let me say it differently. An old covenant person making a transition to the new covenant, they can connect the dots. Are you with me? So notice where Jesus begins in his message. Back up to chapter, I mean chapter 3, go to chapter 3 and jump to verse 14 and let's talk. I'm almost there. Say man, if you're there so I can know we're together. Look with me at verse 14. So Jesus, he does all of chapter 3, then he gets down to verse 14. And notice how he picks up. He says... Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be, do I? Lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So, so let me help you all with this because here's what Nicodemus heard and here's the dialogue that's going on with Jesus and Nicodemus. Hey, Nicodemus, you're a scribe, you're, you're a Pharisee. You are part of that, that Jewish leadership council. So you guys teach the Old Testament quite well. So you remember that passage in the Old Testament where it talks about the people being in the wilderness and they were being bit by serpents and, and they were dying. And then God says to Moses, construct this pole, put the serpent on it. And when they look at the pole, they're going to live. And Nicodemus is like, yeah, Jesus, I get that. Then Jesus said this, guess what? It wasn't about the serpent and the pole. That was a prophetic moment to point to me. <laughs> yeah, so, so who you're seeing right now, Nicodemus, is the real dude that's going to go on the pole. I wish I had somebody in here and die for you. And, and imagine now Nicodemus in his confusion because all Nicodemus knows is not salvation by grace. All he knows is salvation by works. So I can hear him, what do I need to do to get that? And I can hear Jesus saying, you don't got to do nothing, but I wish I had somebody in here. You just got to believe. So he opens up. He opens up verse 16, right? And listen to what he says in verse 16. Nicodemus, lock into this. For God, so what? Love the what? The world. Come on. For God, so what? Come on. For God, so what? And, 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 and here, here's, what I, here's what I love about that is if you look at the Greek word cosmos and you look at the Greek word agapeo and what it's saying, Jesus really had to explain this to Nicodemus because Nicodemus was coming from a Jewish framework where the only people that believed God loved them were Jewish people at that particular day and age. And remember with me, John the Baptist's forerunner was, was, was changing the paradigm by saying he doesn't only love Jews, but he loved Jews and Jews. Gentiles alike. I mean, he came for everybody, his whole created order, every person made in the image and likeness of God. He loves them. Come on, isn't that good news? So, so if, if he were to share some things with Nicodemus, here's what Nicodemus heard. He says, when Jesus says, for God so loved the word, Nicodemus heard, number one, that God loves you. Oh, come on, point to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Come on, say, say, neighbor. God loves you. Come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. God loves you. Now, now, the reason that's important as elementary and as simple as it may sound is what's nuance in the verb love in the Greek, right? It's, it's this eris indicative. And here's what the eris, the eris tense says, is that time has no bearing on the action of the verb. Y'all didn't get that. Y'all didn't get that. Let me tell you what that means. Here's what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, God did not wait until you were born and watch what you're going to do. And depending on how you conducted yourself, I wish I had somebody in here, decided on whether he was going to love you or not. Come on. God's love is timeless. Come on. He loved you before the foundation. I wish I had somebody in here. He loved you before the foundation of the world. Oh, Jesus. 
Yeah. So, so here's what this looks like. Nicodemus, God's love is immutable. It's unchangeable. God's love does not vacillate based on your behavior. God's love doesn't change based on what you did this morning or what you're going to do tomorrow. His love is consistent. Oh, come on, come on, y'all. That's good news. You see, you see, what I appreciate about God's love being stable and God's love being consistent, it's not like human love. If you mess with my family, my love for you is going to go down a little bit. And at some point on the continuum, it's going to change from love to dislike. And you keep messing with me, it's going to change to what? Hate. And when it changes to hate, here's what's going to happen. It's going to dictate my behavior. Oh, y'all be honest with yourself. Don't act like you always loved everybody you've seen. Don't act like you've never cussed some people out. Don't act like you've never done something that was not like God. And the reason being, in our flesh, our love changed based on the behavior of the people we were engaging. But what I love about God, it doesn't matter what I did yesterday. It doesn't matter what I say right now. I wish I had somebody in here. It doesn't matter where I find myself tomorrow. His love stays the same, and that's good news. Come on, y'all. That's good news. Bernie, God loves you. Come on, Jesus. What do you mean God loves me? Did he see what I did yesterday? Yeah, Nick, he still loves you. Come on, Jesus, what do you mean that's good news? Did he see where I was last week? Yeah, Nick, and he still loves you. Come on, Jesus, what do you mean that's good news? Didn't he see me when I pulled into the Euphoria shop? Yes, he did, Nick, and he still, I wish I had somebody in here. That's good news. What do you mean he loved me? Didn't he see what I was doing on the Internet? Yes, Nick, he did. And he still, oh, come on, y'all. And he still, come on. And he still, he still. That's good news. See, righteous folk can't handle this because we want God to dislike people because we pray three times a day and they didn't. So, God, you can't love her like you love me. I'm holier. And if Nicodemus had time, Jesus would say to him, hey, Nick, tell some folk all their righteousness is as filthy rags. Yeah, yeah. So so he loves, he loves, he loves, he loves you. He so loves the world, okay? Now, here's the beauty of God's love for, for the world is this, is that he loves you so much that he translated his love into action by demonstrating his love. That's, that's, the, that's the good news right there. I've been married, I figured it out now, 35 years. Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah, yeah. At that length of time, you ain't got no choice but to love each other. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, y'all. It's just too much work to start over. Amen? <laughs> Be frank and honest with you. I ain't learning nobody again. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's just it. Amen. But, but here's what my relationship looks like. It's Christmas season, and early this morning, my wife kept saying, if you listen to me carefully, you'll figure out what I want for Christmas. <laughs> That's what she said, right? If you love me, you'll listen to me carefully, and you'll figure out, don't be saying amen, amen. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll figure out what I want for Christmas, right? And then, and then, then she got this. She got this. I've been listening to you for 35 years. Yeah, you know, fellas, we we don't we don't listen well. Amen. <laughs> you know. And so, how we show love is not always the way the recipients of the love believe love ought to be shown. Are you with me? I remember in my younger years of marriage, uh, coming out the corporate world, I was a hard provider. I worked hard. Did a lot of engineering stuff, brought the money home, gave my wife a nice house, nice car, all that good stuff. And she'd say, you don't love me. And I'd be like, well, what's wrong with you, girl? (laughs) Yeah. You see, in in my mind, I was translating love into the things that I did. For her, it was just an emotion. You can get Different thing. But listen to the text. Because God loves you, he gave his what? Son to do what? 
die for what? Now, now the problem, the problem, the problem you and I have humanistically, because we're humans and because we're frail, we don't see the theology that's hidden beneath the phrase he gave his son. Because here's what we do. When we see the word son, we, we interpret it through the lens of our own children, and we see I have two sons and, and how many? Four grandsons. No. Yeah, two sons. Yeah, yeah. I got, I got two sons. Amen. Because I'm getting trouble. Um, but, but when I think son, most of you would say that's his son, but that's not him. That's what you'd say. So when you hear God gave his son, even though you're not saying it in your mind, that's his son, but that's not him. And because of that, you don't see the depth of what's connoted or implied in the statement, he so loved the world that he gave his son. Because hear what you say, that's his son, but that's not him. Let me help you all understand what Jesus was saying. Are you with me? Can, can, can we go there for a little while? That, that's very, very important. Because if I were to jump ahead of myself to Philippians chapter 2, here's what you'd find around verse 7, right? He, he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant. And then it'll say, being found and fashioned in the form of a man, he became obedient unto death, even what? The death on a cross, right? And then it says here in the next verse, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above name. Here's how the Baptist preacher used to say it. Here's what God did. Because he couldn't find a person holy enough. Because he couldn't find a person righteous enough. He took himself. And then he took earth and he formed this vessel to house himself in. And then he took himself and he placed himself inside the form of this thing and placed it on the inside of Mary and gave birth to this fleshly being that even though it looked like you and it looked like me, it was God, the, I wish I had somebody in here. It was God the whole time wrapped up on the inside of flesh. So here's what God did. Here's what God did. He loved me so much. Sam's Clubs and Walgreens and Zales, come on, and Jared's and the most expensive store didn't have a gift valuable enough that he literally gave himself, I wish I had, to show me how much he loved me. Come on, y'all, are you getting this? So here's what you need to know. If you've accepted Christ inside of you, God himself, come on, living on the inside. You want to talk about a great gift. God himself living where? On the inside. I got the hands of God. I wish I had somebody in here. The Spirit of God. So Paul says it this way, let this mind be in you, which was also who? In Christ Jesus. So whatever Jesus have, you can have too. Oh, that's good news. Oh, that's good news, y'all. That's good news. You can keep your Christmas cake, but give me Jesus. Y'all not hearing me. You can keep your jewelry, but give me Jesus. Come on. You can keep whatever you have, but give me Jesus, God's greatest gift to man. Because when I get Jesus, I get God himself. And that's because he loves me. Now, I don't know about you, because this is not Santa Claus theology. Because here's what Santa does. Depending on when you're naughty or whether you've been nice, It'll dictate the quality. I wish I had somebody. Yeah. God's theology is, it didn't matter whether you've been naughty or whether you've been nice, you still have access to the same God. I wish I had. Yeah. And that's grace. That's grace. So Nick, 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 Nick. God loves you, Nick. 
And God loves you so much. He incarnated himself in the form of flesh so you can have access to God. So here's what that means, Nick. You don't have to go to the priest no more. Hey, God, what's I'm supposed to do with all my training? That's cool, but I just made you a real priest. Access, right? I'm almost done. I'm almost done. A couple more things real quick. Let me show you this next one. So here's this. So here's why God gave his son, right? To prevent you, Nick, from going to hell. And yes, I did say hell on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Wow, Jesus, what do you mean to prevent me from going to hell? Well, Nick, you remember chapter, verse 14 of chapter 3? As Moses lifted up the serpents in the wilderness, here's what this means. Here's what this means. Here's why I'm here. In the Old Testament, in that passage, the Israelites, God brought them out of Egypt. They were on their way to Canaan. And they decided to mouth off against God and against Moses. And here's what God did. He, he, he released these, these fiery serpents. And in the release of these fiery serpents, they were biting people. And here's what happened. When they bit people, they would die. So the people said, God, you got to stop this. But they were so afraid of God, they went to Moses. Moses, intercede. Go to God. Tell him, stop this. Here's what God did, Nick. God told Moses to take you a rod and, and, and to build this thing up and then take a serpent, a fire, one of those fiery serpents. Moses did a brazen one and place it on it. Now, now, if I'm Moses and my folk are dying because these things are biting them, I'm not placing it down in a valley where they're going to have a hard time seeing it. I'm probably going up on a hill somewhere. Y'all not hearing me. <laughs> and I'm placing this thing on a hill. And here's what it looks like now. So whenever anybody gets bit, they don't have to stay there and run to the wrong person for healing. All they got to do is look to the hill. Oh, y'all going to get this. Y'all going to get this. Y'all going to get this. <laughs> and, and, and because they looked to the hill, their life was spared and they were able to live. So here's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, just like that happened in the Old Testament, it's the same way under the New Covenant. Here's what's going to happen. God gave me his only son. Come on. He gave me himself. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go on a pole, on a hill, and I'm going to die for your sins. And here's what's going to happen. Whenever the serpent bites you, some of y'all... Don't go to the voodoo, man. <laughs> don't, don't go to the wrong priest. All they have to do is lift up their eyes to the hills from whence cometh their help. Their help comes from where the Lord, come on, the maker of heaven and earth. So here's what's going to happen. God sent his son, so if you accept him in your life as personal Lord and Savior, there is nothing the enemy can do to kill you because Jesus has come to give us life and that much more abundantly look to Calvary and live. Wow. That's good news, Jesus. We didn't talk about that in the Sanhedrin. It was all about law. You mean I don't have to work? All I got to do is look up? Oh. I don't have to come to church every Sunday. All I got to do is look up? Yeah, Nick, it's that simple. For by grace are you saved. Through what? Faith. It is what? The gift of God, not works. Isn't this good news? So no one can borrow both. And, 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 and it's really that simple to be a radical disciple. It's I need to know that God loves me, number one. I need to know God gave his son to die for me. And number three, I need to know the reason he gave his son to die for me was so I can escape the grips and the jaws of hell. So Nicodemus was presented with choice, right? He was presented with choice. He was presented with choice. He's presented with choice. So, so here it is. Here it is. In response to God's gift, either you look to the cross and live, or you turn away and die. Nicodemus understood that because he knew what happened by way of Old Testament history to the folk in the wilderness who didn't look to the pole. And he connected the dots. Hey, Jesus, if I want to be a radical disciple and I don't want to go to hell, 
I just need to accept you into my life and I can live. Yes, Nick. I'm glad you got it now. You don't have to go a second time into your mother's womb and be born. It's a spiritual thing. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Accept me into my life. So here's where you are. Here's where you are. Here's where I am today. Here's what this looks like. If I'm here and like Nicodemus, I want to be a secret radical disciple. Because he wasn't ready for everybody to find out yet. Because he still had to go back to that council meeting. And he couldn't go back to that council meeting talking about, yeah, I gave my heart to Jesus. So he's in this save and didn't nobody know it. It's okay to be like that for a while. And, and, and if you want to be like Nicodemus and give your heart to Christ, you're faced with a choice. Look to the cross and live or turn away and die. Right? So I'm going to get it right. New Year's, no, sorry, Christmas. <laughs> Let me get it right. Christmas Eve, I'm going to get it right. Hey, y'all edit that, all right? Christmas Eve, when you just found out that God gave you himself as a gift. Imagine the gift that you can give him if you in turn give him you. Right? Imagine, imagine, imagine the gift. He didn't give us second best. Yeah, yeah. He didn't give us a piece of him. All. In its entirety. So imagine if today you give him all of you. I know somebody's saying, well, preacher, oh, he already got me. I gave him my heart. Yeah, but that's your heart. He wants your brain. He wants your eyes. He wants your legs. He wants your feet. He wants your hands. Come on, y'all. Yeah, 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 yeah. He wants all. He wants, yeah, he wants all. He wants, he wants the total corporal being of you. Imagine if today, not, not waiting till January 31st to say, I'm going to start fresh. <laughs> but now, the Bible says it this way. Come on, worship team. Behold what? Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So imagine on Christmas Eve, you came to church. Heard the little kitties do their thing. Did a beautiful job. Heard worship team. It's a good time of worship. And imagine if you leave here and say, man, I gave God the best gift. Dude, I matched his gift. Imagine. He gave me him. I gave him me. And I've escaped the grips of hell. Imagine what kind of gift that would be. So I need to bow your heads. Inclusive of myself, we're all faced with choice. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? If you're here and you don't know God, if you haven't said yes to him, I want to give you a chance first to process. Salvation is simple. Scripture says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth, and believe in our heart that God raised Christ from the dead, we shall be saved. It's that simple. Not running the aisles, jumping pews, none of that. Just confess and believe. Salvation is ours. Then if you're like me, you heard that word and you're like, man, God, you didn't have all of me. I need to give you all of me. Rededication, God, I want to recommit my life. I want to start again. I don't want to do it right. I want you to have all of me, God. All of me. All of me. So I'm praying, God, forgive me for blowing it. God, forgive me for messing up. Lord, I want to start fresh again. So just in your own way, go to God. We worship you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Worship you, oh God. Worship you. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Let's 
substantively. We give you God, Lord.